Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. And welcome to for this slow coffee morning session. This morning, we have the pleasure to welcome Myrtille Lapuel and uh, Alexandra Briens from Coblenz Avocat. And they will talk to us about French employment low case law update. So Michel de Fabiani is with us from the franco british Chamber Board. And the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, before we start, just uh, uh, to, I want to welcome uh, to the second law coffee morning with our partner Koblenz. I don't know if the pronunciation is right. It's not the German way, Koblenz. It's Koblenz. Koblenz. Thank you. Uh, on the French employment law and case law update. Uh, as some participants have not joined yet uh, and other people were interested, but we had a lot of events on that day. Uh, we even had an ambassador briefing at the chamber, which is not yet finished uh, almost. Uh, we, there are plenty of, of meetings, so it may be useful to, to mention that uh, the presentation will be circulated uh, or will be available uh, at the chamber and people are encouraged to put questions by mail to our partners, Koblenz Avocats, so that they can uh, follow up more specifically for those who are not either present online or uh, have not been able to, to reach us today. So uh, thank you again for uh, wel welcoming this uh, morning coffee, low morning coffee. Uh, well, at a time where there are obvious difficulties on employment severance uh, in many companies, recruitment also, it is actually important to remain connected with any update on French employment law. Uh, respecting French employment law is probably the number one rule for anyone who wants to have business in France. It's uh, very well known that uh, employment and employees are uh, very critical and con considered as number one stakeholders. So on that tone, I want to pass the floor to our partners, Koblenz Avocat. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michel. Merci uh, beaucoup. Um, so hello, Alexandra and I are very pleased to be back for this uh, case law review. Um, what we've uh, structured the presentation is we have picked up decisions that cover the main area of employment law, contract, remuneration, working time, uh, staff representative, and uh, termination. And for each topic, we will both recall the general principle and uh, present the decision. Um, so let's start with uh, employment contract and uh, with a very specific one, which is fixed term employment contract. So this kind of employment contract is uh, very specific, uh, notably since neither party may terminate it prior to its end, except in the event of an amicable separation or serious misconduct, force majeure, or if the employee find a permanent contract. Uh, the Labour Code contains an exhaustive list of the grounds that can be used by the employer to use the fixed term contract. Uh, I will not list all of them, but mainly replacement of an absent employee, except if it's an employee on strike, a temporary increase in the company business, which is maybe one of the most tricky and seasonal employment contract um, or the one that are used for um, practice where it's a constant common use to, uh, to have a definite term contract what we use uh, to um, call contrat d'usage. When the party enter into a fixed term contract for any other reason, 
as this employment contract is automatically deemed to be for a permanent term and therefore may give rise to claim for damages for inferred dismissal, uh, severance indemnity, notice period, uh, notice period normally not being applicable to a fixed term contract. In this specific decision, uh, the Supreme Court uh, reminds that a fixed term contract signed for the reorganization of the commercial department does not qualify as a precise ground, and therefore the fixed term contract must be requalified into a permanent employment contract. So this, this uh, decision is, um, I would say, quite common. It's just to remind you that um, the use of the fixed term contract could be um, tricky uh, and should be used with moderation because the common idea that uh, a fixed term contract is more flexible uh, is not exactly the case in front. Um, then uh, another aspect of the employment contract, uh, which is the modification. In France, when an employer seeks to modify an element of the employment relationship, it is necessary to determine whether it's a change, is a mere change of the employment working condition, or is considered as a change of an essential terms of the employment contract. Any modification of an essential element of the employment relationship no matter how important this modification is, must be considered as a modification of the employment contract, which therefore requires the prior and formal consent of the employee. When an element is considered as essential, is determined by reference, um, it's, it's determined sorry, by reference to contractual pro provision or to elements which generally are considered as essential in any employment relationship like remuneration, working time, uh, could be place of work in, in certain, certain circumstances. If the employee refused to consent to a modification of an essential terms, the employer will be required to either withdraw the proposed change and maintain the pre-existing contractual condition or to proceed with the dismissal of the employee. In itself, the employee refusal to consent to the contractual amendment cannot be regarded as fair ground for dismissal. Therefore, when the employer chooses to dismiss an employee, we refuse a modification of the employment contract the employer must be able to demonstrate that the dismissal is based on a real and serious cause, generally for economic reasons. Uh, it is on a case-by-case -case basis that case law identifies in which circumstances a change would either be considered as a modification of an employment contract or as a mere change in an employee's working conditions. In this case, um, September, an employee was recruited to work 35 hours a week. And on a systematic basis, the employer asked the employee to work over time, uh, 39 hours a week. And at some point, the employee refused to work over time and was dismissed by the company for gross misconduct. The court um, here decides that the fact that the employer systematically reports to over time hours constitute a modification of the employment contract. And the employee could therefore validly refuse to perform over time hours. And the dismissal was judged unfair. So uh, it should be keep in mind again that any modification of this essential terms required the prior consent of the employee. You should also have in mind that for protected employees, so uh, staff rep representative, for example, the mere change of an employee working condition also requires the consent of the employee. Um, and the fact that the employee accepts for a certain period of time uh, to whatever is the modification is not sufficient and that for the modification uh, to be validly accepted, you will need uh, a right and position uh, from the employee. So employment contracts, uh, again, brought a specific um, uh, condition, which is maternity. 
So employee and maternity leave are protected, uh, and there's two types of protection and two types of period of time. So there is an absolute protection uh, with no possibility to notify or even to start a dismissal procedure during mainly or exclusively, sorry, maternity leave and the holidays period that is just following the maternity leave. It is possible to not notify the dismissal outside those period, and in particular during the 10 weeks after the end of the maternity leave, only in case of impossibility to maintain the contract or for serious misconduct was cut. Um, there are also specific obligations as, such as no discrimination, reinstatement after the maternity leave in similar condition, and also the need to offer the possibility of a professional interview after maternity leave. Uh, here we have uh, mentioned two um, um, not case, we have an opinion of the Supreme Court, an avis de la Cour de Cassation, and a decision from uh, the Cour de Cassation. Uh, in the opinions, the Supreme Court confirmed that an employer may terminate the employment contract of an employee for serious misconduct unrelated, obviously, to, her, to the pregnancy uh, situation during the 10 weeks following the expiration of the maternity leave, even if she is on sick leave. So it's just a confirmation that it is possible in certain circumstances to terminate an employee um, during the specific 10-week protection of the, after the maternity. Moreover, as the Supreme Court uh, also considering the December 2021 decision, that the fact that the employee did not benefit of the interview that I mentioned earlier even return out from maternity leave cannot justify the nullity of the dismissal. Um, so again, uh, very careful about maternity leave and I also draw your attention on the fact that now um, Pfizer are also protected and there's also a paternity leave and, uh, and they also are protected uh, during the paternity leave. So that's quite recent. So uh, you should keep this in mind also. So remuneration, um, which is uh, also uh, an important area of discussion, obviously. Um, so minimum salary is defined either by the law or the collective bargaining agreement, uh, CBA, in consideration of the classification of the concerned employee, classification being um, a level are determined also by the CBA, depending on uh, the background, um, the training, uh, this kind of thing. Um, as mentioned previously, any modification of essential terms of the contract requires the prior consent of the employee. Modification of the remuneration obviously requires the consent of the employee. Uh, in this specific case, the employee was claiming that he should have been have been benefit from an increase of his remuneration when he was promoted. So uh, at the time of the promotion, he signed an employment uh, amendment with no increase in remuneration. And two years later, he claimed for more money. And the court considered that the employer has no obligation to increase the salary since the employee had expressly accepted the modification of his, uh, of his employment contract. So remuneration, again, uh, more tricky, viable remuneration, uh, which is one of the questions that we often uh, has. Viable remuneration can be discretionary, uh, subject to the equal pay principle, or with targets. In this case, targets must be in French or French employee and provided uh, at the beginning of the reference period. So that's the two main important points. It is not possible to subject the payment of the bonus to the presence of the employee uh, on the payment date if the employee has work for all bonus reference period. So uh, it, it would be possible in other cases, but if the employee um, has work during the whole period, then you should pay the bonus. Two decisions here again, 
The first one is about an employer that failed to consult the employee on the annual objective as required by the employment contract. So in this instance, the employment contract uh, provides that the employer and the employee must discuss the annual objective and the employee, a uh, very usual decision, was therefore entitled to 100% of this uh, valuable remuneration. Um, the second one is also very classic, is uh, recall that when the objectives are defined by the employer as part of his power of management, the employer may um, modify them as long as they are achievable, they have been brought to the employee attention at the beginning of the year. So I would also remind you that the drafting of your valuable remuneration provision uh, are very important because depending on how it is drafted, your power to modify or not the valuable remuneration uh, will be extended or restricted. So now I will uh, let Alexandra present cases about very nice subject also in uh, French employment law, which is working time. Do you hear me correctly? Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> so now let's switch to another topic, which is working time which is a topic where we have quite a lot of litigation uh, in France. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is about maximum working time. <clears throat> so on the left, you see a summary of the main rules in relation to maximum working time. So first, normally an employee should not work more than 10 hours a day. There are a few exceptions such as night work or for employees who are under 18. Then an employee must not work more than 48 hours a week. Again, there can be some exception. You can receive some permission, for example, from the labor inspectorate in some situation to exceed this threshold. And finally, also, employees should not work more than 44 hours a week on average over 12 consecutive weeks. And here also, you can, in certain circumstances, you know, go beyond uh, 44 hours a week. so in January this year, the Cour de Cassation rendered a decision. Uh, in relation with a driver. So this driver has worked one week, 50 hours, okay? So obviously beyond the threshold of 48 hours, and he asked uh, damages for that. And the Court of Appeal at first hand said, you can't ask damages unless you prove a prejudice, okay? So this case then went to the Court of Cassation, our Supreme Judicial High Court, who said, no, when you infringe maximum working time, automatically, the employee is entitled to damages without having to prove a prejudice. But this case law is quite interesting because the judiciary changed its mind on this matter because a few years ago, we had a lot of case law saying that when a rule is infringed, you don't need to prove your prejudice. Then case law changed and started to say, no, you need to prove your prejudice. And now we have again this new decision to say, no, for maximum working time, you don't need to prove a prejudice. So it's quite interesting uh, to see that even, you know, the French Judicial High Court is not really clear <laughs> on the situation when you need or not to prove uh, specific prejudice before obtaining damages. But here, probably they consider that maximum you know, working time is really something essential because in relation to health and safety of the employee, which might explain the reason why automatically you can be entitled to, to damages. We also have in French law quite um, extensive rules in relation to holidays. Okay? So again, on the left, you have a, a brief summary of the rules in relation to holidays. It's not an exhaustive list because the regulation is quite uh, complex, but basically in France, employees are entitled to five weeks of holidays for a complete year. So basically they acquire 2.5 days per month. Um, there are various rules around holidays, meaning that normally the employer must inform the employee of the period during which they can take the holidays and also of when they can uh, leave and the criteria if two employees, for example, want their holidays at the same time. 
And all this, you have time periods to comply with, which are on the screen, but I will not go into all those technical details. Um, this case though was quite interesting because there was an employee who claimed that uh, his employer should compensate him for his holidays after the termination of his employment contract, arguing that in practice, even, of, even if on his space slip, it appeared that he had taken his holidays, the reality was that he worked during his holidays. And uh, another colleague brought a uh, testimony uh, to prove that he has worked during his holidays. And so in this situation, the court says it's not enough for the employer to show that he has paid the vacation. So on the pay slip, he must demonstrate that actually the employee took really his holidays. And because here the employee could prove differently, then the employer had to compensate uh, the uh, holidays and had to pay an indemnity uh, in, lieu, in lieu of holidays. So you must really be careful, you know, regarding any employee who just, you know, starts answering to a few emails during the holidays and so on. And probably you should remind them if you see that, that holiday is holiday and, you know, they need to rest uh, because otherwise you might find yourself in a similar situation as this one. Well, on working time, we have a specific form of working time in France, which we call in French forfait en jour. So this is usually mainly for top uh, managers, so executive, uh, cadre, even if it can sometimes be extended beyond that. It's a working time organization by which an employee works a number of days per year. So usually it's 218 days. It's really a specific working time organization because first it must be authorized by the collective bargaining agreement. So either by the one applicable at the level of your industry or by a company wide collective bargaining agreement. And also the employee must expressly consent to this working time organization, meaning that you need a specific clause in the employment contract. Then, as I said, this working time organization is not for any kind of employee. It's really only for employees which are autonomous in their work and cannot work, you know, collective hours. You also need to check the CBA because sometimes the CBA say you can only be working uh, for Fejou if you are classified at that minimum level, you know, in the classification of the collective bargaining agreement, or if you have only that level of remuneration. So it's really important to check always in that matter, the collective bargaining agreement. Also, obviously, people that are working a number of days per year, they might have some issue regarding health and safety because meaning they could work, you know, really long hours every day. So with this working time organization, the employer has an obligation to implement various measures to ensure the workload is reasonable. So we list those main measures on the screen. So first you need to monitor days work and days off. So it could be, for example, an Excel document, you know, the employer complete and send to his manager, but it's important that the manager check, you know, the documents. Uh, disconnection rules, so basically a policy reminding that, you know, you need to disconnect and, and so on. And also you need to organize interviews to discuss the articulation between professional activity and personal life, so to, to ensure that the workload is reasonable. And it's a time, you know, for the employee also to speak up if he has any issue uh, on that topic. So here we have a case law of February uh, in relation with uh, fourth visual. So it was the story of a woman who was a, a vet, so working in a, veterinary, uh, in a veterinarian clinic, okay. And she considered that because she was for jour, basically she could show up at her job just when she wanted, okay? Because she said, I'm autonomous in my work, so I can come at nine in the morning, 10 in the morning, and so on. Obviously, this did not work for the employer because there were appointments, you know, people who were coming with their dogs to have uh, to see this uh, doctor and so on for the, for the animals. And obviously, if she wasn't there, you know, it was really a problem for the employer. And in the end, after asking her to comply, the employer decided to dismiss that employee. And here, the court said, yes, the dismissal is valid, because even if the employee is autonomous, you know, the employer could still require the employee to be present at work uh, at a certain period of time, you know, to be able to answer to the needs of the client. So it's quite interesting, because we have always a lot of debate and a lot of employees saying, no, I'm autonomous, I can do, you know, whatever I want. 
uh, in a way, yes, but subject that this doesn't harm, obviously, the activity uh, of your employer and that you are here for the meetings and so on. Another topic, which is also in a way related to working time, it's remote work. Of course, as everywhere over the world, it has become something quite popular with COVID and so on. And remote work is regular, regulated by French law. So either you can implement it through a collective bargaining agreement or a policy, but you will need to consult your Works Council, which is now known in France as a social and economic committee. Even if you don't have a collective bargaining agreement or policy on working time, I'm sorry, on remote work, you could implement it just subject to an agreement between the employee and the employer. So for instance, by an email between the manager you know, and the employee. Uh, it's important to note that if you implement remote work with a policy or the CBA, then the law indicates exactly what you need to put um, in your documents. In practice, we always recommend our clients, you know, to have a policy or collective bargaining agreement and try to avoid just having a, a short email, you know, between the manager and the employee agreeing on work on remote work. Because then it's at that point that you might have some issue because then the employee might say, oh, I'm always authorized to do remote work. And once you want to end remote work, it's at that point that you have a problem. And this is exactly the situation that illustrates this court of appeal case of uh, court of appeal case of Orléans. So it was an employee who start, started to work remotely. Okay, so and there was a kind of implicit consent of the employer. Nothing was written in the employment contract, but this has gone for years. Okay, and at some point, like five years later. The employer said, sorry, but we want you to be at the office, you know, two days a week for such and such, you know, operational reason. And the employee then left on sick leave and then sued the employer claiming constructive dismissal, uh, arguing that they should obtain his consent for such and change. And here the Court of Appeal said yes, because even though there was no written clause in the employment contract, in practice, there was a tacit agreement around this modification of the employment contract. And the employer could not change that without the employee's consent. So you see, this topic is in relation with what Mirti explained to you at the beginning about modification of the employment contract. And it's quite interesting because here nothing was written, but still the courts say it's the modification of the employment contract. So it's quite protective of employees. And it is why we really recommend not to agree uh, like, like that, you know just between manager and employee and remote work or just by email, but really have a clear policy which set the rules, also the rules that will authorize you to end it, okay? So for example, you have an issue with that employee, you could have a notice to end uh, the remote work. So it's quite important to organize uh, remote work in your companies. Then I will give them the word to Mirti. She's going to talk to you now about another topic, which is discipline. Thank you, Alexandra. Okay. Um, so yes, discipline. So uh, implementing disciplinary measures is subject to specific rules, as always uh, in French law. Uh, the main ones are um, that it is necessary to initiate the disciplinary procedure in the two months period following the discovery of the wrongdoing. Uh, the fact that no sanction that was imposed more than three years before the disciplinary proceedings were initiated may be invoked to support a new sanction. And the last one, which is the one that was uh, discussed in front of the um, Supreme Court is, it is forbidden to sanction twice the same facts. So here in the March decision, um, uh, the courts recall that if the employer pronounced two sanctions at the same time for the same facts, um, in fact, both must be canceled. So you can think that maybe the second one uh, would be cancelled, but the first one would be maintained. No, uh, here the um, employer both uh, change uh, first the uh, uh, the schedule uh, in the shift of the employee, and at the same time decide the disciplinary layoff. And uh, the courts uh, consider that the, the both sanctions must be cancelled. Um, termination. 
uh, which could be also a very tricky one. This one is a, a very specific, is amicable termination, uh, which is known as the rupture conventionnelle uh, in French. Uh, it's a specific termination procedure by which both parties agree to terminate the employment contract, which is not, which means that uh, uh, neither the employer or the employee um, needs a, a justification to terminate the, uh, the, the contract. This procedure requires to complete a specific standard form by using uh, what we call TDRC, uh, which is uh, through internet. Uh, the procedure will take around five, six weeks. So you will sign the form. Uh, generally, we'll also prepare uh, some kind of uh, a, a, an agreement that would uh, have the, um, the particularity of the, of the agreement because the form is really a two pages, uh, which no place to uh, had anything. Uh, then each party has a 15 calendar days period to withdraw their consent. The form sign is then downloaded in TDRC and the administration has 15 business days to approve or reject the amicable termination and the silence is equivalent to an approval. Um, we choose two decisions again. Uh, the first one is uh, a, a reminder. Uh, an amicable termination of the employment contract that is signed within the context of moral abuse caused by sexual harassment is void. Uh, so you cannot sign this type of termination in this very specific context. Um, the second one is more uh, on the process. The um, employer must, must be able to prove that the employee has received one original of the signed amicable termination form. So if not, the amicable termination is not valid uh, and it will uh, be considered that the employee has been unfairly dismissed with the uh, uh, consequences attached, which is uh, globally a payment of damages. And um, I take this opportunity to remind you that now since uh, about four years, we have the Macron scales that determine the damages in case of termination, and that this uh, scale has been uh, recently validated by the Supreme Court. Uh, we were all very anxious about, uh, about this decision, so uh, um, I take this opportunity to inform you uh, about that if uh, you miss this information. Uh, so uh, one last decision about uh, termination, which is not uh, exactly uh, only linked to termination, but also about uh, power to terminate and delegation of powers. Um, so in France, um, termination at will does not exist. So you need to have a real and serious grounds for things. Then you need to follow a specific procedure. Um, here we mentioned the one applicable to uh, individual termination, personal and economic termination, but you should uh, know that uh, you have a, a different procedure in case of economic termination when uh, you have a collective redundancy. So in case uh, of an individual termination, you have to invite to a pre-termination meeting. Uh, then the pre-termination meeting will take place five working day after the invitation. Uh, and then you will have to send a dismissal letter by register mail at least two working days, uh, could be more, and no later than one month if it's a disciplinary uh, dismissal. Here is the decision was about the power of the actual director that signed the uh, implements of termination. Um, and the court uh, decide that the human resource director of a subsidiary of a group cannot notify a dismissal to an employee of another subsidiary. So the, um, the uh, question of the power in group are uh, something that we are we receive, uh, often question about. Here uh, in the decision, um, the decision was based on the following facts. It was not demonstrated that the human resource management of the company employing the employee fell under the responsibility of the human resource director of the company of the other subsidiary, 
not that the later had any power over the management of the subsidiary. And it is a criteria that we will always have to check in case of uh, delegation of power. Even if it's in a group, you will have to check that somehow there is a, a, a link of, sub of subordination between the, uh, the two persons that the, the, de the delegator and the delegate. So it's uh, your turn now, uh, Alexandra. So let me just. Yeah. Let's switch to another topic, which is non compete clause, which is both actually linked to the employment contract, but also to the termination of the employment contract. So, non compete clause is a really a specific clause that you can put in the employment contract only if it's really necessary to protect the legitimate interests of the company and if it's proportionate. Because of course, the non-compete clause is a restriction to the freedom of the employee to find a new job. So we don't recommend obviously to have such a clause in any kind of employment contract, okay? So first you need to think carefully, do I need really a non-compete clause? Then the contents of the non-compete clause is strictly regulated, so your clause which must be in your employment contract, must be really carefully drafted. So first, it should be limited in time and space, and also there should be a financial compensation. What is important here is to check your collective bargaining agreement, because a lot of collective bargaining agreements set the rules in this area. So they will tell you, I don't know, a non-compete clause cannot be for more than 12 months, or the financial compensation must be, I don't know, 50% you know, of the average salary. In practice, when nothing is said in the CBA, we would at least recommend a financial compensation of around 30% of the average salary. Of course, it could be more because all depends on the type of job of the person, but also on how long you know, the clause will apply. If you apply it, which will only be in really rare cases for two years, obviously it's likely that the judge would consider that 30% is probably not sufficient. So it's really an analysis on a case by case basis. So it's really a topic on which you should probably be advised. Uh, also, when you draft your clause in the employment contract, it is important to add a waiver clause. So a clause by which the employer could at the time of the termination say, I will not apply the clause. And then of course you will not have to pay the financial compensation. But it's really important here also to check the CBA and to waive it at the appropriate time in compliance with the contract and the collective bargaining agreement. And what often happens, and what we see with Mirti, is that employers tend to put always, you know, non-compete clause for whatever kind of job, and then they just forget about the non-compete clause, and then they realize, oops, I forgot the non-compete clause, but it's too late to waive it, and then they have to pay the amount to, I don't know, an assistant or somebody which really doesn't compete, you know, the company. So it's not a clause that should be a standard, you know, clause uh, in the employment contract. And here we had a case uh, in October this year, uh, last year, about the financial compensation where an employer wanted to have the judge revise the amount of the non-compete compensation, considering it was too important. Uh, and the judge said no, because the financial compensation is salary. Okay, so it's not up to the judge to revise this amount, which qualify as salary. It's not what we call in France a penalty clause. So again, this illustrates the fact that you really need to think carefully, because if you forget to, to waive the clause, and even if your company is in a financial difficult situation, the judge cannot revise the amount, and it doesn't matter that in the end the employee isn't working for a competitor. So again, be really careful on this type of clause uh, in your employment contract. Then in France, we have also staff representatives. Now to so the main staff representative body is called the Social and Economic Committee, Comité Social and Economic. In the past, it was known as the Comité d'Entreprise Works Council. So the name has changed. Basically, you need to elect the Social and Economic Committee in any company uh, with at least 11 employees or more over 12 consecutive months. The fact that you are a foreign company doesn't matter you still need to comply with the law. And so this body must be elected every four years. The electoral process is really strictly regulated. 
And it's now we have a lot of companies in France that are currently doing again the electoral process because it has been four years since the Social and Economic Committee was uh, created you know, by the law. And the role of the Social Com Economic Committee varies depending on the workforce. So if you have less than 50 employees, the role, the mission will be more reduced. If you have more than at least 50 employees, then you have more extensive obligation toward the Social and Economic Committee, such as, for instance, to consult them every year on three main topics, such as the economic situation, or also, for example, the uh, strategic orientations of the company. So here we put um, two, two cases in relation with uh, elections. The first case related to the safety manager of a company. And the safety manager in the company usually attends to the social and economic committee meeting because he's here to help on matters such as health and safety. And the social and economic committee is competent in relation with health and safety. And um, the question was, is it possible for the safety manager to be elected as a member of the social and economic committee, because in a way he can come to the meeting and you know perhaps explain the position of the employer on such and such aspects of security, you know, in the factory and so on. And yes, the court said yes, he could be elected because in a way he's not really you know uh, in at the same level as a director of a company or the HR who really always you know represent employer. Then we have another case which actually triggered two decisions, one of the Cour de Cassation and one of our top constitutional court, which is the Conseil Constitutionnel, which relates to a company called Carrefour that some of you may know. There was election at one of the, uh, of the uh, shops of Carrefour and the director of the shop uh, was not allowed to vote. So he didn't ask to be a candidate, but he only wanted to vote. And so the trade union that represents CAD, so the executive, challenged the professional election, saying that the directors of the shop should be authorized to vote. And the Cour de Cassation decided to raise a question before the Conseil Constitutionnel. And the Conseil Constitutionnel said that depriving such employees of the right to vote infringed our constitution. And therefore, should, such employees should be at least entitled to vote, not obviously to be elected, but at least to vote. So it's really a change because in fact, Carrefour, when they took the decision to refuse the, him the right to vote, only applied the case law of the time of the Cour de Cassation. And here, because of the decision of the Conseil Constitutionnel, the Cour de Cassation had to review its own ruling. So it's quite interesting and really We'll have quite a lot of professional election in France over the next months. When we talk about professional election, mean, it means that then you have people who are elected and those people are what we call protected employees in France. Actually, they are not only the members of the social and economic committee that are protected, but also the delegates syndicaux, so the trade union representative, or also even candidates to the election are protected, for example, during six months, even though they are not elected. So for all those people, there is a protection against termination at the employer's uh, decision. So for example, in case of dismissal, amicable termination or forced retirement, mise à la retraite, the employer must obtain the express authorization of the labor inspectorate. And before that, depending on the cause of the protection, it should also obtain a, an opinion of the social and economic committee. So there are really strict rules uh, on relation uh, on that topic. And there was uh, some debate in France on whether or not in a company with less than 50 employees, you need to obtain the opinion of the social and economic committee on the project of, for example, dismissing such protected employee before you can apply for the permission of the labor inspectorate. Because you remember, I just told you that the role of the social and economic committee is not the same in the company with less than 50 employees or with 50 or more. And here, our Supreme Administrative Court, which we call the Conseil d'État, say that no, you don't need to obtain the social and economic committee opinion in the company with less than 50 employees. So it's quite a good decision because we had some doubts uh, on, on that matter. So at least, you know, this decision uh, clarifies uh, the topic. So, 
I don't know if you have any question. We have went through our various cases. Um, so I don't know if you have some, some topics you would like to, to discuss. I think Michel has raised his hand. Yes. I have raised my hand, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. So, well, thank you for this very dense presentation. Um, I just wanted to, to come back on uh, remote work, teletravail, because in fact, everybody has been on remote work during the COVID situation. So I just want to, to confirm or, or know, um, if you have no agreement with the employees on teletravail, can you refuse to all your employees teletravail? Can you refuse by category or case by case? And can you set different number of days provided you have no agreement? Huh? Well, basically all the issue is about the fact that you don't have, you know, a clear policy, okay? So obviously there was the COVID situation where there was a kind of emergency situation. So, you know, we had to do what we could. Everybody went remote work and it was, you know, not really organized, okay? Uh, so obviously there is still a principle of equality, you know, between employees. So if there's a difference of treatment, you need to justify why, I don't know, assistant A, you authorize three days, but as system B, you authorize only two days, okay? Because obviously they are doing the same job. So then you need to give an objective justification. I don't know, they're working for such and such director that has, you know, this specific need. Now that we are hopefully a bit beyond COVID, or at least with a more normalized, uh, let's hope, situation, it's now really important for the companies to really think, you know, about remote work, stop this kind of a, uh, ad hoc practice with everybody doing a little bit what they want with just, you know, a nice little email from the manager. But let's hope at least there's an email because it's really important if there's a work-related accident, okay? That we know the employee is not just on holiday. Uh, so now it's really the time to really set up, you know, clear rules. And in those rules, really, as you said, Michelle, you need to think uh, with the managers, um, uh, can this employee do more or less than his colleague and to have an objective justification? And the real issue we have in company that is that sometimes you have managers saying, no, no, I hate remote work. I will never accept it for my team, okay? And then you have his colleague doing the, exactly the same job, you know, but for his team, oh, like, yes, I like remote work. So here it's where really HR needs to work, you know, with uh, the managers because you can't have really two different treatments for people doing exactly the same job, because then obviously they can sue you and say, you know, this infringes the principle of equality. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Well, uh, if there is no question, uh, first, I, I suggest and we'll discuss with you uh, to, to put your presentation, certainly to send it to our President's Forum and corporate members uh, and see if, if we put it online or not, we'll discuss that with you. Um, and. Uh, so I, I understand we are almost at the conclusion time, if there is no question. So my, well, first, thank you very much for this very elaborate presentation, it's very dense. Uh, the, the, the new case laws are very interesting because they sometimes reshape the, the practice or the law. Uh, so my first uh, comment is that Obviously, you always need to be very cautious in France on uh, employment law, and you should interpret it, I would say, cautiously and in the safe side. And, and certainly discuss or try to discuss it with your employee representatives, whatever their, their form is. Uh, and, and the second point, uh, which we, we, we see from that presentation is very clear now, is 
whatever the competencies of your lawyer, of your legal, uh, legal manager, of your HR manager, uh, I think the, the conclusion, and I, I suppose you would agree with me, is that um, uh, it's better to consult with a specialized lawyer uh, and, and we, we can indeed at the chamber offer you these uh, possibilities. Uh, it's better to consult with a specialized lawyer before embarking in uh, new uh, decisions uh, on, on new uh, policies, on new practices, because as you've seen, uh, it, it can be very detrimental to the company. So uh, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I've learned a lot, I must say, uh, just between you and me all, uh, going to Cour de Cassation is not a terrible thing. Personally, I have been in Cassation for my personal retirement uh, scheme because I was in disagreement with my employer, my former employer, which is a big international group and, and a French subsidiary, and we agreed that uh, we, we, we disagreed. So we went to the decision of the court, la cour d'appel, I think, or whatever court, first, first decision. They gave the, the right to the, my employer. I denied it and I went to Cassation. And I have to say that within a few months, probably three months, even less, I got the answer and the Cassation was in my favor. So uh, it, it's always, there is hope in whatever uh, legal action you take. It looks very ambitious sometimes, but it's pragmatically possible. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure you, you remain at the disposal of any uh, chamber member who wants to consult you by, by mail uh, directly or for us as, as fit, as, as they want. Thank you, Thank you again. Much. Thank you very much, Michel, and, and all the people of the chamber. It's always a, a pleasure for us to uh, participate to uh, this webinar. Uh, you're right. Uh, I would obviously recommend to, uh, to ask a, a lawyer to help you in, in, in the drafting and, and on the yes. implementation of the procedure. Uh, we also try to be pragmatic. So we also know that our clients need in this very complex environment to take decision not only based on a conservative position, but also some time in consideration of, of the business. Um, so um, this is our goal it's also to, uh, to help our client to, uh, to take a business oriented decision uh, within the, uh, this, uh, this environment. Um, so we will, uh, and we hope that we would propose other webinar uh, in September. Uh, we will discuss this with, uh, with the team.